right? I'm talking about when we come into a place and we come in, hey, we can feel good because of music. We can feel, you know, good because of motivation, but it's, it's God working in our lives, right? That's what brings us together as a church family because it's, it's God backing up what he says, right? I mean, every song, those songs were perfect for uh, what you've been going through now, and that's just, that's awesome. And, you know, it does make you wonder, why, why, does, it, why does God work or kick in when he does, right? You know, but thank goodness he does, right? So what a tremendous, I'll tell you what, your, your all's testimonies, you guys hear from me all the time, your testimonies. Listen, you guys are going through some stuff, and I know sometimes you think it's scary to get up here, but listen, you don't realize what your testimony does for other people that might be going through something. So you ever feel God lays something in your heart or he does something, you want to share it. Listen, you know, you need to share it, right? Share what God's doing. It's powerful. All right. Beats anything I got lined up here, so. <laughs> you want me to do more? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes, Don, and we'll see how it goes. And maybe so. Probably have you come up at the end. <laughs> well, Russell Herman, 67 years old, lived in Illinois, and upon his death, it's been a few years ago, incredible, generous man, he left a staggering amount of bequests of his fortune to be distributed to several people family members, and even entities. I've got just a few here for you. Um, he was a carpenter by trade, but it says in this that he left $2 billion for the city of East St. Louis. He left um, another billion and a half to the state of Illinois. Some of you, if you don't know, I used to live in St. Louis. If you don't know, East St. Louis is Illinois. It's not the Missouri side, all right? Um, two and a half billion for the National Forest, and to top the list, Herman left six trillion dollars to the government to help pay off the national debt. So that's pretty amazing, except when Russell Herman died, he only had a 1983 Oldsmobile. <laughs> he didn't have any of that money. He never had any of that money, but his will literally left all of that. Wow. <laughs> This little article says his promises were meaningless because there's nothing to back them up. Oh. Very fitting, again, down in our testimony. We have a God. We don't have to worry about him backing up his promises, do we? He guarantees it. We got a good one for you today. Deuteronomy 31.6. Look at the verse. It's in purple back there on the table when you go to pick one up. Memorize. You should be familiar with this verse, but... Let me say it, and then we'll read it out loud together. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will never fail you nor abandon you. The perfect song Chris started off, the praise team started off with this morning. Um, let's read that together, all right? Start there. So, so let's read it out. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Now, these are some pretty powerful words, and I want to kind of right off the bat set up some context here, and it's really fascinating. These are some of the, uh, uh, not very last words Moses spoke, but they're among them. He gathered all the children of Israel together by God's command, Moses is at this time when he basically gives these words from God. He's 120 years old. Most of you know when God called him to lead the children of Israel out, he was 80. And then, of course, they spend the 40 years wandering around in the, in the desert, right? Um, so at 120, he gathers them all together. He's at the end of his life, and they're about to cross the Jordan River to go into the Promised Land, all right? But Moses isn't going to go with them. He's not going to be able to lead them. And Moses had lost that privilege. As great as Moses was, he was a man, and Moses had sinned. And this sin was all the way back into a place called Meribah. And it was at Meribah where the children of Israel, you know, again, this is very late in the journey, they were complaining again about being in a place without water. Which you can, you know, if you are familiar with the story in the Exodus and in the fall, we're going to kind of, kind of, kind of be in Exodus a little bit. But um, 
They were constantly complaining, right? They were regular people, always something to complain about. They found themselves often in a place without water, and God would provide, and everything would be great, and then they'd complain again, right? Can you imagine a people where God takes care of you, and then when things aren't going so well, you start complaining? Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Sounds very real life. So they're without water, they're complaining, they go to Moses and Aaron, they complain to them. Moses and Aaron, the Bible says, they go to the entrance of the tabernacle, they fall face down on the ground at the entrance of the tabernacle and cry out to the Lord. And the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Moses and God told Moses to take his staff. This is the same staff that, again, God had had him use to part the Red Sea, same staff used to... Uh, that. Um, it thrown down and became a serpent in front of Pharaoh and uh, all the plagues and everything else. But he was supposed to take that staff and he was supposed to speak to a certain rock. And from that certain rock, God would send forth water. Well, when Moses got the group all together, Moses was upset with them. He was mad at them for all their complaining and their rebelling against God. And again, he'd seen it time and time again. And Moses, in that anger... He struck the rock, the Bible says, twice, and water gushed out. And all, the Bible says, all the children of Israel were watered, all their livestock, everything. This great miracle happened, and everything sounds great, and it doesn't sound like a big deal. It seems very minor, but Moses hadn't specifically followed the exact word of the Lord. God had told him, speak to the rock, and he struck the rock. And also the Bible tells us that Moses took credit for the water coming forth. And because of that sin, that kept Moses from entering the promised land. It kept Moses from leading the children of Israel over into the promised land, crossing the Jordan. And so God has Moses um, gather all the people together. God has told Moses, you're going to die. It's very, when you read through, it's so, uh, it's so just matter of fact, you know. And God just says, all right, Moses, you're going to die. <laughs> Get the children of Israel together. <laughs> and he's given them these words to say to him because he's going to commission Joshua. Joshua, who'd really been his, his second in command, um, head of the army and everything. Um, it's going to be all turned over to Joshua, and it would be Joshua that would lead the children of Israel across the Jordan. And so God is speaking to Moses to what to speak to the people. He's also telling Moses, this is what you say to Joshua. And so I want to set this all up. I want to read you the verses. So Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're going to read verse 1 through 8. So look at these verses here. The Bible says this. It says, when Moses had finished giving these instructions to all the people of Israel, he said, I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. Now, it's interesting that the Bible actually tells us that Moses, he never, he never lost his sight. He never lost his strength. That the day he died, he had as much strength as he ever had. So this wasn't, he wasn't able ability. He wasn't able because, again, he'd sinned, and God said, it won't be you. You will get to see it, but you won't get to enter it. <clears throat> Verse 3, But the Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy the nations living there. You will take possession of their land. Joshua will lead you across the river just as the Lord promised. The Lord will destroy the nations living in the land just as he destroyed Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites. The Lord will hand over to you the people who live there, and you must deal with them as I have commanded you. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. That's what. So God was giving Moses this word to give to the children of Israel because they're about to cross over. They're about to experience again uh, enemy that's got possession of the land God's giving to them. All right. So He's preparing them for that. And then in verse seven, then Moses called for Joshua, and as all Israel watched, he said to them, "Be strong and courageous." For you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them as their grants of land. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. 
So these are pretty powerful words to the children of Israel. They're powerful words that were given to Joshua. But are they powerful words to you? Right? That's what we really care about. It's awesome what God did, but you want to know, what about me? Do these words translate from the context of that story to me? Now listen, I'm not going to take, and I'm going to waste time building a case to get it to how it relates to you. All right? I'm not going to waste time building the case to convince you from Scripture. I'm going to just cut right to the chase. I'm going to give you a verse. It's Hebrews 13:5. The Bible says this, God has said, I will never fail you, I will never abandon you. So there we have New Testament promise, Old Testament truth, all right? So like I said, we're going to just cut right to it. I'm telling you, these verses declare that this wasn't just for the children of Israel, it wasn't just for Joshua, but it's for you as a believer as well. You're one of his. So our verse, Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic before them. The Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. So we got three great promises tucked in that verse. I want to break this down, all right, for you. Three great promises. God promises you his leading presence. God promises he will not fail you. God promises he will not abandon you. Well, let's talk about that. God promises you his leading presence. So it's amazing you and I want to be in God's presence, right? When you and I, anywhere, especially when we come to church, the Bible says two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of you. So we have an expectation of God's presence being here. We want to be in God's presence. You want to be always in God's presence. But this is more than just presence. This is talking about his leading presence, his leading presence. Listen, he's giving you something that there's... Nothing you can face, no problem, no struggle, no circumstance, no trial, no battle, no attack. There's nothing that you can face that God's not already there. Now, I want you to think about that. Because, again, you things happen, and it's just the way Satan uses it. When bad things happen to you, things you don't like, it always is what? God, where are you? Why did this happen? Right? I want you to think about the fact that you serve a God who's already there. Before you ever got there, God was there. Wherever you are, he's already been there. Wherever you go, he's already waiting for you to catch up to get there. God's always leading you forward. God's always going to lead you to victory. Wherever he leads you to, he'll always lead you through. Always lead you through. David wrote this, Psalms 139.5. I don't know if it'll be up here or not, but it said, David said, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. So think about this. We're talking about his leading presence, him going before us, him being the God that's already there. But he also says, all right, I'm also behind you. I mean, think about this. You are encompassed by God in his presence, right? You can't go anywhere where he's not. You haven't been anywhere where he wasn't. Again, if you're one of his, there can't be a surprise attack waiting for you because he's already there. There can't be a sneak attack from behind because he's got you covered there too. Just got taken out by a microphone stand. On. God knew it was there. <laughs> God's got you covered. Listen, You've got to come to a point where you trust God's presence surrounding you, before you, behind you. And when you do, it will you'll struggle less with the struggles. You can be strong and courageous. That's what he's calling you to do. When you, when you look at that, there's these great promises here, but what are the promises about? Don't panic. Don't be afraid. Be strong. Be courageous. God wants you to live a life of faith that's strong and courageous. Are problems going to come? Yes. But God's, the problems are for you to be strong and courageous, not for you to panic and be afraid. You're never going towards defeat as a believer. You're always moving towards God's victory. You and I, whenever we face something, you know what, a lot of times, and maybe it's just me, but I'll, I'll make an assumption that you too, 
we often think that we're just we're kind of in this game of life and God's on the sidelines or he's in the stands kind of watching how we'll play it out. That's not, that's not the correct image to have. That's not right theology. That's not what your Bible says. God is not, you're not just, remember the old, this is really going back, remember the old uh, electric football game, guys? <laughs> Where the thing just vibrated, you know, you just stand back and watch, right? <laughs> that's not the life a believer lives. God's got this. Let me give you a, a great example of this. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. I think these verses will be up here. David's got the Philistine army coming down on him. He's This isn't the first time. He's always gone before the Lord to seek God's guidance. God's oftentimes told him to attack and, and what he needs to do. And This time David goes before the Lord in 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 22. It says, Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up, circle around behind them, and come up on them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly, for then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gazir. Listen, that sound of the marching in the mulberry trees that was God, the angelic host, the army that was going ahead to fight the battle. David was just in cleanup mode. It had already been done. And the Lord was very specific. Just be there, but don't do anything until you hear my working. And when you hear my working, then you go and you clean it all up. Right? God went before and this great encouragement. Listen, it's also a warning. Don't get ahead of God. Don't get ahead of God. Don't try. You'll never get ahead of God. but Because God already knows you're trying to get ahead of Him. Right? But don't try it. Listen, God is always leading the one who's following. Right? <laughs> Think about that. I know it sounds simple. But God's always leading the one who's Following, right? Let God's presence lead. David sought the Lord's guidance. He waited in obedience for the Lord's instructions. He was victorious because he followed the word and working of the Lord. He let God lead. Trust his presence. Follow his leading. Trust he's already there. Look back at our verse, Deuteronomy 31 6. Again, the bottom half of that verse for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you. God promises he won't fail you. It's impossible for God to fail. Therefore, it's impossible for God to fail you. Now, this truth is probably hard to really get a grasp on because, let's face it, you've encountered a lot of failure in your life, over your life. People have failed you. You know, I'm not going to do it or I'm not going to ask you to name them out loud, but if I said, somebody, does a name come to your mind? If I say, hey, can you think of anybody that failed you? You got a name, don't you? You probably have more than one. You probably got a few. You can make a list. People have failed you. There's a lot of times you've probably felt that people have set you up to fail, right? They get a kick out of that, right? And listen, if you're honest, then you know you've experienced your own failure. You've experienced your own. And one of the greatest examples of this in Scripture is obviously Peter denying Christ. You know the story. The verses won't be up here, but I want to just read it to you. It's in Matthew chapter 26. This is before Jesus is going to be betrayed, before they go to the garden. Jesus has got the disciples in the upper room, and he has this conversation with them. This is actually going to take place right before uh, Jesus goes and prays in the garden, right? Remember, they all were sleeping. They wouldn't stay awake and pray with him. So this is the conversation that Jesus has with Peter and to all of them. It says, on the way, Jesus told them, tonight all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you. I love that. Even, he already knows what's going on. Even Jesus reaffirming, always affirming God's word. I'm going ahead of you. The disciples didn't even know what that meant at that time. <laughs> they were clueless. But he's telling them, I'm going ahead of you. 
to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Don't you know Peter? Peter's looking at the other disciples and he's like, I'm with you, Lord. These are no gooders. They're, you can't trust any one of them but me. I will never desert you. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you'll deny, <coughs> excuse me, three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Scripture said. And you know the story, right? Jesus betrayed the rooster crowed three times. Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. That chapter of Peter denying Jesus, the Bible says when Peter heard that rooster crow that third time, the words that Jesus spoke flashed in his mind, Scripture says, and he left and wept bitterly. Who knows our hearts better than we do? God does, right? Always. Always. Listen, I say all that and use that example that Scripture gives us, the example God gave us, reserved for us. Listen, don't let your own failure or others skew your view of God's faithfulness. We say that again. Do not let your own failure or others' failure Skew your own view of God's faithfulness to you. It's impossible for God to fail. It's impossible for God to fail you. Some of the last words that Moses spoke to the children of Israel, I don't know if it's going to be up here, but Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 5, again, uh, 40 years they've been in the desert. You may or may not be familiar with this fact, but Moses told them in verse 5 and 6 of Deuteronomy 29, I've led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. How would you like to have a pair of shoes the last 40 years, right? They don't make them like that anymore, do they, people? <laughs> it says you've not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, just meaning that they hadn't provided for their own for that. That you may know that I am the Lord your God. Listen, you and I, we go through things. And, you know, we wonder, we ask, why God, why? And while we don't have all the answers, the bottom line answer always is that you may know that the Lord is God. That's why you go through some things you go through. And you may think, well, I don't like that. <laughs> Listen, when you go through something and you realize God is the Lord God, I promise you, you will do nothing but fall on your face before Him. Because it's always amazing what God does. Remember we talked about the verse we talked about last week, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good, right? Listen, when you come to the place and you recognize that God is the Lord God, and He can take anything and everything and work it out for your good, for His glory, It'll make sense. Second Timothy 2.13 If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. All those years, the children of Israel, 40 years, complained, and yet their shoes weren't wearing out, their clothes weren't wearing out, they complained about not having food and water at times, and God always provided for them. And he didn't provide because they complained. He was always going to provide. He just put up with their complaining because even though they were unfaithful, they were wandering in the desert for four years because they'd been unfaithful, remember? They didn't go in and take the land like they were supposed to. They were scared. They were unfaithful. Yet God was still faithful. Listen, whatever failure you've created or failure you've experienced, God is still faithful. Still faithful. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. You plant your feet in the unfailing word and work of the Lord. One last thing here at the bottom of Deuteronomy 31, 6. The Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. 
he will not abandon you. That word abandon means having been deserted or cast off. You ever felt that way? You ever felt abandoned or cast off? Maybe you felt alone, abandoned. Maybe you felt that way by friends. Maybe even family. Maybe sometimes you wish you would be abandoned by family, right? <laughs> Maybe someone you trusted or should have been able to trust, and you feel kicked to the curb, right? You might have genuine abandonment issues. And listen, what others have done to you can carry over into the way you view God's care of you. And you have to be careful with this because, listen, God's not them. Maybe you felt God doesn't care about you, God doesn't love you, God's unaware of what you're going through. Maybe you felt God has abandoned you. David felt that way. Let me give you some verses. I don't know if it's up here or not. Psalms 27, 9. Do not turn your back on me. Do not reject me, your servant, in anger. You've always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Let's be honest. You're going to feel abandoned at times. It's going to happen. There isn't anybody in this world that's ever lived that hasn't felt that. Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, the truth of the matter is, the only one that's ever been abandoned is God's Son on that cross when he took your place, when sin was put upon him. And that abandonment was done for his love and care for you. Listen, you're going to feel abandoned by God at times. But it's like a lot of things. Feelings aren't truth, people. <laughs> feelings are not truth. Feelings are fickle. You know how it is, right? You can like one thing one day and not like it the next. God isn't man. God isn't them. God has never abandoned you. Bible says Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man. He does not lie. He's not human. He does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? And those questions are all rhetorical because the answer is no. Your abandonment feelings do not carry over to God. And you can't go down that road because that's just, that's just chasing a lie. And that's from Satan. So, have you been abandoned? No. Will you feel abandoned? Do you feel abandoned? Have you felt abandoned? Yes. So, what do you do when you feel abandoned? What do you do? I got a simple, simple verse here for you. All right? Simple verse. It's Psalms 9, verse 10. When you feel abandoned, the Bible says this, those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So let me just wrap all this up with a bow here real quick, all right? When you feel abandoned, here's what you're going to do. You're going to call out to God. You're going to tell him how you feel. No different than what David did. No different than what scripture there says in Psalm 9. You're going to tell him how you feel, and then you believe him, you're going to trust the God who says he'll never leave you, never forsake you, never abandon you. You're going to trust in what he says. You're not going to trust in what you feel. You're going to trust in what he says. Call out to him and lay it all out. Tell him, this is the way I feel, God. I don't feel you care. I don't feel you are aware. I don't feel you understand. But then listen, you need to listen to the Lord and speak to you. And you need to trust. You need to trust. Jesus told the disciples, Be sure of this, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Be sure of this, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. That age is the end, before he makes all things new. And it's not just a promise to them, but a promise also to you and me. Listen, God promises he won't fail us. He promises he won't abandon us. Do you trust that promise for me? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Just be thinking. Listen, are you going through something? Have you gone through something? Listen, somebody's failed you. We get it. You're not alone. <laughs> I'm not trying to make light of it. But we don't have to go into it. We get it. Somebody you trusted let you down. He was a parent. He was a spouse. Maybe a child, uh, some family member, maybe he's a friend, maybe he's an employer, I, whoever it is, doesn't matter. You felt let down. You've been let down. Don't let that failure, and then there's your own failure. Not just someone else, but you. You have failed. No different than Peter. The Bible tells us later that you remember when they're out fishing after Jesus' death and resurrection, that he's on the shore and he's got the fish baking and he hollers out to the disciples if they've caught any fish. They don't know at first it's the Lord, but then they figure it out and Peter jumps out of the boat, comes to the shore. And Jesus has a great conversation with Peter. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, the whole time, as the three times Jesus asked him, Peter's crying out, Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. God knows you love him if you're one of his. But you know, God's trying to get you to understand that you love him. <laughs> and that you need to trust him. Whoever's failed you, even if it's your own failure, God is faithful. He will not abandon you. He will not leave you. Cry out to him. Lay it all out what you feel. Then when you walk away, trust him and trust his word. Fathers, we come before you, God. We thank you for your word. That God, we can come in here and God, we can be encouraged and we can be challenged, dear God. Your word is not just words. It's power. It's your working, dear God. And God, you want to show us that you are the Lord, our God. God, I pray you drive that home to us, dear God. That God, when we go through these feelings of abandonment or, or, or whatever it is, dear God, that God, you would just let us understand your presence. You're the God who's already there. You're God that also is behind us. You've got us completely encompassed. So God, why should we be afraid? Why should we be discouraged? Why should we panic about anything, dear God? We just need to rest in our trust of you and your work. God, I pray your people here, I pray they get that from you today, dear God. They'd be encouraged. They'd be bold. They'd be courageous. They trust you. I ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, put that one to memory, all right? I know that's a little longer than some of our other verses, all right? But it's a great verse. You need to tuck that one away. Just real quick again.